I'm going to give you this. This is something. This is probably the most important you're going to hear tonight. I want you to pay attention. So when the, when God set up His church, the true church of God, a New Testament local church in our church history, this is how it follows. One, the Bible is the final authority. Now, why is it that we are King James only? You ever thought of that? Because Calvinists and all, nearly every evangelical Christian church, including Joel Osteen, would even say that the Bible is the final authority in their final creed. However, how, how Satan attacks that is, well, let's see if you'll really believe it as your final authority, when he gives 200 plus different versions of the Bible and man picks whatever wording they want because if they choose that word in their verse, it supports their own doctrine that they want to support. So then this is, so Satan is going to attack this and we will see that. That's why KJV onlyism is important. Why? Because a perfect word of God is absolutely important. And the evidence is looking at critics like James White when he does his crooked debates and pulls up different modern versions to support his biased Calvinist uh, man-made arguments. That's important. The evidence is looking at all these TV preachers. They use many different modern versions. Why? To support their sermon. That's their final authority. So the Bible quickly becomes out of the final authority and then what becomes the final authority is man. That's why Satan attacked it with Alexandria, the first centuries, from Egypt, who became the, always the consistent enemy ever since before the time of Abraham. That's why the devil, he raised up the modern version committee. That's the reason why the devil raised up the Jesuits who were ruined by the Great Awakening revivals and Protestant Reformation so they can only come back through Westcott and Hort and attacking the institutions that paved the way for the French revolutions with their age of reason, age of enlightenment, and German rationalism and English deism. But we shall cover that in our world history class. Now, when Satan sees how God sets up the New Testament church, what is Satan going to do? He's going to attack every pointer. The second thing is literal biblical interpretation. Literal biblical interpretation. That's why we stress so much on being dispensationalist in being premillennialist. You might say, why? Because premillennialism and dispensationalism is born from literal biblical interpretation methods. We rightly divide verses because we literally take it as it says that it's faith and works for salvation in one verse and Faith alone, not by works for salvation in another verse. Amen. We take it literally so we rightly divide it. Hence, that's why we become dispensationalists. We literally believe it when it says rightly dividing the word of truth. We literally believe that. See, people who are post-millennial, amillennial, you know what kind of mi mindset they go by? By meaning, not by literal words what the Bible says, right. what it means. And then they make, so it goes by, again, their bias of choosing historical timelines, historical arguments, rational explanations to justify it rather than the Word of God itself. That's dangerous. And Satan, you know which group he used again for that one? Who was infamous for that? Alexandria, Egypt. And today's Calvinists, they adopt that mindset. Liberal schools today, when they talk about the Bible, they adopt that meaning mindset, not literal words. If you if you take literal interpretation, you know what they automatically call you? An extremist fundamentalist, just like those Muslims who take their Koran literally. That's what they do. This is the adoption of a New Testament church. All right, Pastor, you explained all that. Now give me a verse. One verse is simple, and that's Antioch, Acts 11. The home base of the true New Testament church was in Antioch, Syria. Why? Because that is where the, the disciples were first called Christians. If you study world history, it is a matter of fact that Antioch, when they had their churches sent out, where Alexandria started their own churches, Antioch was known for their literal exact interpretation of the Bible throughout the first centuries. Alexandria, they went by, oh, 
our meaning because I'm a scholar and I know better than the Bible. So let's go by scholastic meaning over here. See that? That, that was demonic. Right, right. When Christians today talk about your early church history, they're going to go to Alexandria, Egypt, and Roman churches. They're not going to talk about these guys. They're going to say that they're going to consider these guys as the weirdos, as the cults, just like they accuse you dispensationalists and KJV only people as cults. Satan, that, see, that's a demonic spirit, these Calvinists, these amillennial, postmillennial. Why is it a demonic spirit? That's what Satan did during the time they were accused as being the weirdos and all that. For taking literal biblical interpretation and the Bible as a final authority. The, it is evidence that manuscript evidence come from mainly two lines, mainly two lines. The main line is one from Alexandria, Egypt. And then the second one is from Syria. That's why we believe these two pointers, because of the home base of the true New Testament church. I mean, that's where the Christians were first called Christians, right? Look at Acts chapter 11. Look what the Bible says. Verse 20, uh, let's see over here. Verse 26. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people, and the disciples were called what? Christians first in Antioch. Notice that uh, it was from here that the word of the Lord was being preached. Because keep reading at verse 19. Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenix and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the what? The word. Ah, if you want to find the word of God, then where do you want to find it from? You want to find it from here. Not Alexandria. Never. I'll tell you what, which guy, when he got uh, where he had to get his scriptures from, he came from Alexandria, but he had to get the word of God out of Alexandria and be corrected. So if you want to get the word of God, you got to get out of Alexandria. That would be good teaching right there. That's good teaching right there. Bless God. Praise God. Somebody run the aisles, all right? Amen. Don't worry about John MacArthur and the Calvinists getting a heart attack and say, how dare you do that? No, you should run the aisles and shout to the Lord, Amen. that if you get out of Alexandria, you're closer to the word of the Lord. Amen. Never go down there. You don't believe me? Look, look in your Bible in the book of Acts. Apollos came from Alexandria. He had to receive correction from the scripture, and he came from Alexandria. But he received correction when he was outside. Get out of Alexandria, Amen. man. Man, pastor, you're so passionate about it. Why are you so... Uh, mad about it? Why are you so passionate about it? Why are you so excited about it? Because this is ingrained in our churches today and in our history and infected like a virus. You need to know where your true church comes from. This will be eye-opening to you when you go to church and you're not going to see church the same anymore. And you're going to realize this is a false church. There is teaching something wrong over here because you need to see what a true church is and how Satan attacked it. All right, but there are more pointers for a true church. The another one, let's look at the book of Acts, chapter 13, Acts 13. It is a, an evangelistic church. The true church, New Testament church, is an evangelistic church. It is a soul winning. That's why we do soul winning. That's why we do street preaching. People try to criticize street preaching. Say, oh, no one's going to get saved out of that. People say that, oh, you know, through your own testimony, people will get saved. No, look at the, the evangelism method is ingrained from Antioch. You know, who are the people who sit at home and like to study and use their testimony to win people? Alexandrians. <laughs> yeah, that's true. The, the cult that you should watch out for is the Alexandrian cult. Amen. You got to watch out for that. That's why all the preachers, even those that you would think that are really good guys like Billy Graham, Ravi Zacharias, Charles Stanley, John MacArthur, and all those guys, they all have an Alexandrian cult mindset. That's how you can establish a true church real quickly, right. is the Alexandrian cult. You have to find that, the Alexandrian cult mentality. All right. So look at Acts chapter 13, verse 1. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manaen, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul, as a minister to the Lord and fasted. The Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work 
whereunto I have called them. And when they have fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So notice over here that they're so winning minded church. They don't just sit at home and establish a kingdom, all right? No, they're like, you got to spread the gospel. See these IFB churches? Stay over here, stay over here. Why? Because they want to build a bigger church through you. Some Bible believers are caught in that web. You got to watch out for that. My church, you know what I, I prefer? Get out of here and spread. Because the word of the Lord has to spread. Too many souls dying, going to hell, that I don't need to build my own kingdom here. As much as I want to. You see me online? What do I tell onliners? There are many of them who want to travel over here. You know what I tell them? Go to a local church nearby you. These Bible-believing churches need you. Yeah. That's why I don't grow big. That's why I'm not some of these cultists, you know, S. Anderson, whatever, who like to gather people all around the world at the beginning, and then that's how he grew his church really, really fast until he was actually exposed for where I mentioned that he was like a Jim Jones cult, and then he all of a sudden coincidentally started to recommend them to go to local churches, and he didn't just grow as much anymore at a fast rate. Makes you wonder, right? See, you got to watch out for these IFB cults. All right, so the next one, yeah, I'm preaching. All right, the next one is independent. I'm excited about this teaching, man, because I'm exposing the fraud of the anti-churches. You want to be the true Ch New Testament church. You don't want to be the anti-church history. The stream of anti-church history is the opposite of all this. Always the opposite. So remember that. When you look at that, your world history class is going to go, whoa, and you're going to point out something to your pastor and say, hey, pastor, when you're talking about this, I noticed a sign of anti-church history there. Isn't that a sign of anti-church history? I know it's a sign of New Testament true church history there. Isn't that a sign of New Testament church history? Remember that. This teaching is going to be so important. Because it's not just history. Apply it to today's life and you will see it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. Independent. Notice over here that we don't build an organization. There's no, the, the Baptist Confederation of Churches. Real Bible Believers Confederation of Churches. No, we're not that. We are an independent Bible-believing Baptist church. When a pastor sets up his own independent Bible-believing church, we don't bind each other. We're not binding each other where there's a head organization like a Catholic church system. Right. You know why? Because Bible-believing churches and pastors have different convictions due to the different people and the fields the Lord put them in. And if we have, happen to have a split in the church, the Lord still, still can function His church. Why? Because they're all independent. Amen, amen. So look at, uh, did you read Acts chapter 13? It, what did, we read right here, God said, verse 2 and 3, separate them. Separate them. So Paul, when he started his churches, he wasn't bound by that church. He was separated to start his own churches. That's why look at Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. So why do you think the Catholic Church for the Dark Ages wanted the church to control the states? Why do you think that we live in a day and age where the countries and the state want to control the churches? It's not independent. You notice that? It's not independent. That's why communism is of the devil. That's why socialism is of the devil. Because that's what the Pope did. I read from his article. He took a church mindset to establish it and apply it to the country so that basically that we have to equalize our wealth amongst each other. You can't mingle the church with the world for crying out loud. The world's people are totally different, you got to understand. But what did God talk about in his system? He was a capitalist. He was not a socialist. You look at over here that his economic system is done by capitalism. Look at verse 11, uh, verse 10. But when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more, and they likewise received every man a penny. And when they had received it, they murmured against the good men of the house. It's not equalized. It's not equality. But look what God says at verse 13. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst not thou agree with me for a penny? Look at verse 15. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Right. 
Is thine eye evil because I am good? Look at Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. This is the passage that is used by the Catholic Church, by their socialist agenda program, by communists, and etc., where they believe that you have to equalize the wealth. No, you'll notice over here that it was not mandatory. It was voluntary free will. See this? This was private ownership. This was capitalism. People privately owning something, but out of their voluntary giving, they give to the work of the Lord. If this pastor made all of you pay a certain amount of tithe, then you know what we are? We, this is not a free local church. You know what this is? This is a mandatory dictatorial type of church setting. You notice that? All right, let's look at Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. You'll notice at... Uh, so chapter 4 is their favorite passage where they will use at verse 32 through 37. But this was all voluntary giving. You notice that? Now look at Acts chapter 5. Even Ananias, who was part of it, of the giving, look what Peter recognized. Verse 3, But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine hearts to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Whilst it remained, was it what? Not, not thine own. And after it was sold, was it not in thine what? Own power. Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. See that? Peter even recognized when they were giving, trying to help out the church, or an equal, quote-unquote, amount of wealth. Notice that, Pete, that the church recognized a capitalistic, private property type of system. Why? Because we're an independent church. We're not a mandatory, dictatorial church. That's a Roman Catholic church system. That is a communist agenda. Why do you think that the old man, who seemed to be very crazy, didn't know what he was talking about, drew the Antichrist and underneath it a sign that says, Catholic Soviet Union, Catholic Communist, all welcome. That man was brilliant, man. Amen, brother. It took you this long for you dumb millennials to finally get it. And people start criticizing that man of God when he's the one that, man, the Lord showed him a lot of things. You know why? Because he was looking at church history. History with the Bible. And that becomes, boom, eye-opening. The next one. Look at Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4. Now, this one's being longer, actually, than my uh, other teaching. So let me try to go through this quickly. Ephesians chapter 4. But this is very important because you need to understand the establishment of a true church. The next establishment of a true church is that it is a unified body of believers. It is not a rogue group. Do you understand that? See, they emphasize so much on independent that they believe that they can be rebel rogue and criticize the Bible believers around them. But guess what? You find those same bearded people becoming a cult leader themselves. And if people go rogue on them, then they get all mad and they feel like that they're persecuted and they have a self-persecution complex. You see what this is? This is wickedness. Amen. A true New Testament church believes in a unified body of believers. So yes, we are independent where we don't control each other. But I want to see spiritual maturity that through our own voluntary efforts, we're making, we're giving toward other people, that we love one another, that we're not capitalist, greedy, uh, elitists, because yeah. that has a flaw itself too. Amen. See, he wants us to be accountable to each other. So then if there's a group of Bible believers who disagree with you, you should think twice about, I wonder if the method that I'm doing is right and is it biblical. Well, it's the Word of God is the final authority. That's right. But you got to realize when the Lord established the New Testament church, there are p the Word of God, just because you have the Word of God, Satan can use the Word of God too. Right, right. So what is good evidence that keeps you in check is seeing the majority of other Bible believers who believe this as much as you do, how they believe it. Do they believe the same way as you do? You know why? Because the Bible says that uh, a multitude of counselors, there is safety. There is danger in that self-pride world. 
So it's good to be accountable to other Bible believers. You need that. Right. Oh, you, you're setting up a Catholic church system. You don't want accountability. That's your problem. Right. You want to be a cult leader. This is where cults come from. Cults are rogues outside of the unified body. Here's evidence. And we'll close it here, actually. I think that I'm going to break this into two parts, since it is very important to take time. So we'll uh, end it here. So Ephesians chapter 4, look at verse 3. Endeavoring to what? Keep the unity of the Spirit in the what? Bond of peace. God wants that. He wants everyone to be in peace and unified to each other. Because look at this, verse 11. And he gave some what? Apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. For the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith. See, that's what God wants. See, God wants, so a lot of you members, you can't just, especially people who just studied the Bible for one year. I mean, you got to be definitely full of yourself when you have Bible-believing pastors who've studied the book and ministry for years and years and years. And for you to go rebel and rogue on these Bible-believing preachers should be troubling to you because God set them to you to establish a unified body of believers. But the people who depart from it are what? Look at verse 14. Children carried about every wind of doctrine from what they see online, everything that they watch. 14, that we henceforth be no more children. You're a child. I don't care if you grow your beard this long. You're a child, man. Come on. Rebel rogue, you toss to and fro and carry about with every wind of doctrine by the slate of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. How about that? How about that? That book is amazing about the establishment of a New Testament church. All right, uh, I'm going to give more pointers uh, in our next Wednesday Bible study.